All right, well, um, I think we'll get started. If somebody still decides to join us uh, in the next couple minutes, there's a few, there's one right over here yet, and uh, a couple more over there. Uh, whichever one works good for you. Um, you mind, or should we close the door? I, I guess. In a little a couple minutes, you can maybe in case some other people want to join us yet. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start us off with a word of prayer before we get started, and uh, then we'll dive into this topic. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the uh, greatest example of justice that we could possibly look to, and so we thank you for the example of of your son Jesus that we read about in your Word, and uh, thank you for each person that is here today that cares about others and about um, about this subject, Lord, and I pray that we could together come to some good uh, conclusions and some, some ideas, suggestions that we can take and put into practice as we go back to our home communities, Lord. Uh, so go with us uh, this, over this next hour. Just bless this little meeting here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, welcome. Come on in. Uh, if you want the front here, or there's some, yeah, some folding chairs back there, fine too. All right, well, I don't know um, what you all thought when you saw this topic here. Um, I think we're probably all across the board on where we, where, what we thought this is about, so I hope I don't disappoint you. Um, but, but I would be curious to know um, what all states or communities are represented here. How, how many from, uh, let's see, Ohio? Okay, how about Delaware? And uh, Indiana, nobody from Indiana. D.C., Virginia, um, New York. Okay, yeah. All right. So, so we've got people from all across this. Uh, all right. Yeah. We, 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 give me something that I didn't say. Albania. Albania. How could I have missed that? Right. I'm sorry. Wow. Well, the point of that is that that we are going to from here go into all different parts of the country, all different parts of the world actually, and the, the intent is to then make an impact for Christ, right, in, the, in our communities. How can we uh, bring what we learn into the communities where we live? Go ahead, there's one more over here for you. But what I want us to, to, to just preface this with is that the only vehicle through which we can bring true justice to the people around us is the love of Jesus Christ. God's love coming through us and flowing through us out into those people that we interact with. And so that is what I want us to really keep in mind through this whole discussion, whatever, wherever this ends up going. Because um, if you remember the two most important commandments that we heard multiple times already this weekend were love God, love people, right? Those are the commandments that Jesus showed his followers to follow. Um, and so I think we would do well, though, to start with a definition of justice, right? What do we actually even mean when we hear that word, Jesus and justice? So the, the working definition that we'll work with today, or that I would like us to work with, is the quality of being free from favoritism, self-interest, or bias. So with that definition in mind, though, I want us to, our primary objective to be to determine how Jesus would have us relate to people around us in a way that places um, the value, or, or the, the value that was placed on them by God, that we can bring that back where our society has maybe devalued it or minimized their value. So how can we, um, with respect to this definition, bring value back into people's lives that our Creator has inherently placed on people? Okay, we, we see them all around us. There are people who have been devalued. Now, how can we as God, Christ followers follow his example? We're going to look at some of Jesus' words from Scripture, but we're also going to look at some of just the way he interacted with people. Because I think that's just as powerful a lot of times 
as, as the actual words that he spoke, is how did he live and interact with people, and what can we learn from that as we interact with people? That should be our goal, right? To interact the way that Jesus showed us, because that was one of his primary reasons for coming, actually, is to show us how to live, I believe. Um, so, adding value rather than devaluing people. Um, so, in an effort to show God's heart for justice, human value, um, throughout all of history. I want us to look at a verse from the Old Testament and then a verse from the New Testament just to show how it kind of uh, goes uh, all through Scripture. So, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. It's in Micah 6, 8. So that's the Old Testament, right? Before Christ, God already had a heart for justice, humanity. He places value on people's lives, all right? And I love the way that, that this verse kind of simplifies it and brings out the beauty of, of just, the, there's a sim, simplicity of it, right? Just be kind, right? And don't think so highly of yourself that you think that you elevate yourself above those around you. If we can do that, we're, we're a, a long ways down the line of bringing justice the way Jesus would have us do it. So, justice speaking kindly, just being kind to people, and um, humility. I think those will go a long ways. But let's then look to the New Testament and see what Jesus had to say. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, without neglecting the former. And that's in Matthew 23, 23. So we see that Jesus did care deeply about justice. Because he, he states it very clearly. We can't miss that in this verse. Um, but he lumps these three points together here where he talks about justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So he lumps these together here, emphasizing... Here, uh, I want us to emphasize that here in this little workshop today, that um, I believe that Jesus would have picked this workshop because he says this is the one you really need to pay attention to, is justice. So all those others are important, but this is the one he would have come to, or this is the one he would have taught, actually, right? Of course. So now we, we looked at the Old Testament, we looked at the New Testament. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and, and, and do one more, quote, one more text um, not the scripture, but this is a text from our Constitution in the United States. And, and it really is uh, obviously not as important as the Old Testament or the New Testament, but it's intriguing to see that our, our, our country's founders recognize this truth from scripture as being very, very important for the stability of a country, for the growth, and, and for a society to, to work well. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, hopefully nobody's offended that we bring out the Constitution here in a Bible class, but um, I think, it, I think it, it does us well, though, to look at that and to recognize they saw value in it, and there's still value in, in seeing just that inherent value that God has placed on every single human being. And so a little bit later here, we're going to do a little bit of work um, and, and think through who are some of those people in our lives that have been devalued that we can maybe bring uh, add value to their lives. Now, we're going to try and stay away from kind of abstract ideologies, okay? If we could. Uh, I don't see a lot of benefit in those conversations where we're talking about these things out there that kind of are, um, well, quite frankly, political hot buttons. Um, I want us to talk about our own lives, our own circle of influence, where we live and where we work, and, and see how we can um, add value to people's lives in those circles. So that's going to be kind of where we're going to um, stay today. But first, I think looking at some of the ways Jesus interacted with people would be healthy for us, right? So how did Jesus, in his interactions with people, in his everyday walking and talking with people, how and who did he choose to add value to? 
So first of all, I want to just bring, I don't think we're going to take the time to uh, actually read all of these scriptures, um, but I want to just kind of point it out. And then you can write them down and, uh, and look, read them later on your own. But women in general. I think we all recognize that in that society of Jesus' day, women were definitely looked down on. They were subpar. They were below men. And Jesus made a real point of bringing women along with him in his ministry and uh, allowing them to be a part of what he was doing so they could feel valued, really. He was bringing back value into lives that his society had devalued. And so just by his interactions, I don't know really what he actually said to them, but this way of interacting, I'm sure, brought value to women in general. Um, secondly, uh, the ten lepers. That story, uh, lepers were obviously a, a group of people that the society would have cast aside and said, I'm sorry, but we can't interact with you. There was no more value there. And Jesus touched them and healed them and took time to interact with them. Um, next, Zacchaeus. Rich, a rich man, uh, but probably didn't have many friends. Uh, unpleasant people. Uh, people that, once again, people around them had devalued him. We don't like tax collectors, right? We don't like those people. But Jesus took time, went to his house, spent time with him. Uh, another one I think of is children. Uh, his disciples would shoo them away. you got to leave because Jesus is too important to spend time with you. Uh, a lot of times children were probably devalued in that society. Um, and uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Haiti doing mission work. And down there, uh, children are also really devalued. Just, you know, go get me that. Go pick up that. Get out of my way. Kind of almost like a dog. And uh, Jesus took time, allowed them to come sit on his knee and told them stories and brought value back. Uh, the justice, that's bringing justice. The value that God has placed on lives, not what society places on people. Uh, next we have um, the woman caught in adultery. Sinners. Um, Jesus looked and saw saw her. He actually saw her for who she was, not for what she had done. And he was willing to speak into her life as well and to bring value back. Bring value back into her life. Um, so that's a, another example. And then lastly, the woman at the well. Uh, she was the wrong nationality, the wrong ethnic group. Um, we, and, and a sinner. She had yeah, they would not have, uh, his disciples felt like it was not appropriate that Jesus would spend time with this woman talking to her. And yet he took the time to do that. And so as we look at these, um, we see that Jesus, I want us to just really remember that Jesus is the ultimate example for us to follow. And so we, we read his words in scripture, but we also see how he interacted, like I said earlier. So how did Jesus treat people justly. He did it without bias, self-interest, and favoritism. Jesus was willing to add value to many people in different social classes, financial status, religion, occupation, race, you name it. He was willing to see them for who they were, see them for who his, how his Father had created them, and to add value there. Um, Jews, Gentiles, yeah, all different different types of people. So, let's go back to the, the um, definition here, though, and look at this definition a little closer. So, as you look at this list, the quality of being free from favoritism, self-interest, and bias, most of us probably have one of those that maybe we tend towards a little bit, right? Is kind of the one that we are, is kind of our, our tendency. So, um, I think, I don't think this is a very, uh, this is safe enough space, right? Uh, who, who is, who sees favoritism as the one that's just, that's the one I really struggle with? Okay, how about self-interest? Okay, more of them, okay. Bias? All right. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I would say 
self-interest probably is the one that, that kind of is my tendency here. Um, but uh, as, as we think about which one is the hardest for us to kind of overcome or which one we tend towards the most, I want to make a point here that favoritism, self-interest, and bias in and of itself, in and of themselves, are not wrong, right? Or are they? Okay, I'll give some examples. I like the Cleveland Cavaliers. I do not like the Golden State Warriors. All right? So, that's favoritism. Is that okay? Right? I hope it is. We're going to leave here and I'm going to still like the Cavs and still not like the Warriors. It's okay unless if I'm called on to be the umpire in one of the, or the referee in one of their games, right? Then it's not okay anymore because now I'm going to be using that favoritism and, and making kind of decisions based off of it. I'm going to always be making the call, the close calls at least, based on my favoritism. So I'll be, that would not be okay then. Um, how about self-interest? Is it okay to have self-interest? I think we were created with that kind of embedded in us. It's a self, kind of a self-preservation that God has given us. Of course we have self-interest. I'm going to protect, if a big ball comes flying at me, I'm going to, because of my self-interest, I'm going to block it from hitting me and probably instinctively, even before I save somebody else around me. Now, now there are situations where, you know, just even in the, uh, the assassination attempt, we read about the man who dove on top of his uh, wife and daughter and, and took the bullet for them. That's an extraordinary uh, case there. But our, our instinct is self-interest. So is it okay to be, have some self-interest? Yeah, I think so. Um, how about bias? Is it okay to have bias? Um, what I'm referring to, I think we should probably define that a little bit. Um, I'm referring to our tendency to predetermine an outcome based on what we've experienced in the past. Okay, So based on what I've experienced in my lifetime, I am going to predetermine an outcome when I see a situation unfolding. Okay, That would be bias. Um, you, can, you can say that it's wrong or right, but I think it, it's safe to say that we all have them. We all have a bit of that in us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us a little picture of that here. Um, so you are, you go to the grocery store with your spouse, okay? Your spouse runs inside to get a gallon of milk. While you're out in the car waiting, uh, you see these three cars lined up in the parking lot uh, right in front of you. A nice big four by four truck, a Tesla, and a minivan, okay? You're just sitting there bored. A minute later, these three people, or groups of people, come walking out of the store and walk towards those three vehicles. Now, quickly, place these three groups of people in a vehicle. I think I can almost 100% guess which vehicle you are going to place, which vehicle you will place these three people in. Probably because of past, just bias, past experiences that you've had, right? Now, we've determined that bias is not necessarily bad, necessarily wrong. However, if your bias, if your conclusion is rednecks are too stupid to have a good job and so they could never afford a Tesla so he doesn't get to sit go ride in the Tesla. He put him in the old truck, right? Or you might say, Asians are too weak. They can't even crawl up into that 4x4. Four four. They just they put them in the old electric car that, you know, we don't like electric cars, so stick him in the electric car. Or maybe we say, she's just a stay-at-home mom. She doesn't have a real job. She, she needs a practical vehicle that can haul the most kids, right? Put her in the minivan. If, if that is why you drew those conclusions, now bias is wrong because we've devalued that person, right? We have placed a value on them 
based on our past experiences maybe. And now our biases are wrong and not honoring to God, right? So, we've kind of concluded that these, the definition that we were working with can be okay, right? Favoritism, self-interest, and bias can be okay, and it can be wrong, right? But what we want to determine is where, how can we kind of get beyond these when we're looking to add value to people's lives in our circle of influence. All right, so let's, let's um, I want you to think through this in your own personal experiences. Remember, we've, we've come from all over the place. Different uh, environments, different neighborhoods, different situations. So we have different people that we're going to be able to speak into, right? Uh, bring value to, to um, speak the justice, the Jesus way, right? So I want you to think about three questions. First of all, where do I live? So I'm, I'm going to just pause a moment here between each of these, and I want you to reflect in your own mind. Just think about where do you live? What in relation to the people in that uh, place. All right, next, where do you work? What type of people might you interact with where you work? And then lastly, where do you play? What, what does your social circle look like? Your kids' baseball team, your um, your hobbies, the gym where you go to work out, uh, the, the the group of yeah, who are, where you play, where you do your social activities. Um, so, who are the people in your life currently? These three questions um, need to help us start the process of this the practical aspect of what we're trying to talk about here today okay because these questions are going to lead us to a better understanding of our circle of influence that's the best place where we can begin practicing justice the Jesus way right bringing adding value it's the our, our current circle of influence but I want us to think about two different ways though that we can live out this justice though based on this okay First of all, inside this circle of influence, all right? Adding value to those we come in contact with throughout our day. Throughout an average day, when you're going about your normal life, who are the people, especially the people that have been devalued maybe? Who are those people that you already come in contact with over the course of a day? Um, and as you think about that, Keep in mind our, our, um, our definition that we're working with. What are some of the prejudices? What are some of the biases and self-interest maybe that play into how you relate to those people as well? Okay, So keep those in mind as well. But then secondly, so we've looked at inside of this. Secondly, we do need to also think about outside of that circle of influence. Because I think there's a lot of times where we need to go outside our natural circle of influence in order to bring justice to, into people's lives. Um, those sometimes are easier, depending on your personality. It may be easier outside your normal group of, of, of influence, but it, some people it may be harder as well. So that involves searching out people that need to be uh, experiencing Jesus. All right, Bringing Jesus to them is really how you can best add value. Now this one, though, needs to include prayer. You don't just willy-nilly dive into this stuff. You need to include, uh, be praying about it, asking God to reveal to you what you could do and how that should look. Um, and as you do that, as you pray through that, think about two things. What are your gifts? What are, what are you really good at? And what are your passions? What makes you angry? What gets you up in the morning? What makes you just come alive? when you think about what situations, what, what issues of the day. What are you passionate about? What are you good at and what are you passionate about? Those are two areas that you should think about as you think about going outside of that circle of influence 
in order to bring justice to pe into people's lives, adding value to people's lives, right? And I think many times, I, I can't emphasize enough the value of prayer in this. It is so, so crucial. Because many times as we start praying about these things, God can start working in our own lives as well as in situations that come up and opening doors for us. And uh, we'll be amazed at how God works. God does not have an overabundance of people wanting to speak into people's lives. And so if he hears that you are willing, if you tell him that you're willing, he's going to use you. He's going to find a way to, to allow you to, to speak into people's lives in these ways. So, um, and I think a lot of times, okay, so we talked about prayer being an important piece of it, right? But we also have to then get up off of our knees and do something as well. There is a time for prayer, and then there's a time for action. And a lot of times, as we begin moving, that's also where God begins working in our lives and starts changing our hearts as we... Um, as we start speaking into those lives. I'm going to give you a quick example uh, in my own life. I have three teenage daughters. Actually, two of them are now not teenagers anymore. Um, but as I, was, as I have been um, reading uh, more and more about human trafficking and about how these women, are, young girls and women, are being treated so badly, it, just, it made me angry to think that this is actually happening in the world I live in, right? And so I determined I would do something about it. And I started interacting with, um, there was actually a lot of illicit massage parlors in our area where trafficked women are being used. Uh, men come in and, and, and they're forced to provide sexual services to these men, okay? The women who are trafficked at these massage parlors. And so I started reaching out to the men that were coming to these massage parlors and just uh, encouraging them to rethink what they're doing, go back home, don't don't get involved in this. And um, I did it because I was angry at these men who were who were doing this low, low, um, horrible thing to these women. But as I began interacting with these men, I found myself actually with a love for them. I started seeing the hurt in their lives and and the brokenness and the the level of the level of hurt in a man's life to, to cause him to stoop to that level is really pretty significant. And I began seeing them, the, 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 that side of them, rather than just being angry at him. And I know it was God. It was only God that could have changed my heart in that way. And so as you begin speaking into people's lives and adding value, you will find God probably doing a, an interesting work in your life as well. And so... So, so that's that's a, a, just a little example um, from me. But I want us to, to I want to get into some examples from you all. Um, and so I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's if this size group would be better if we. I, I think we can just take some some input from people in the group. But so we're gonna we're gonna look for some examples from you. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it in order. First of all. Who are the people around us that have been devalued? Okay, so I want to hear, um, let's see, I think we could, I'll write them on the board here as you give them, okay? So in your circle of influences, I guess, or if maybe even outside of it, but who are the, the human beings that we may come in contact with that have been devalued in our society? that are not experiencing justice that Jesus would have them experience, the value that God has placed on their lives. So who, who might be some of those people? Human beings. Foster kids. Foster kids, all right. That's a great, great example. See if I'm intellectual enough to spell this right. Intellectual. Okay, great example. Addict. Addict. 
I should have got my wife to do this piece of it. What? What's that? Boys. Boys. You want to be more specific? I think, I think that like children, boys, and maybe teenagers, boys as well, are being devalued, and they're being placed into boxes that fit girls. Okay. They're being told to like act a certain way. Okay. They're not being valued for what they bring to the table. All right. Well. Okay. We'll put that down. Excellent. Elderly, they're just in the way. Kind of sometimes people can get that feeling. Homeless. Homeless. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm going to add traffic victims because that's close to my heart. I would say children for other other cultures. Other cultures? Okay, yeah. There was another one right back there as well. So just immigrants, maybe? Immigrants or, with or just without paper. Okay. Um, I would also add um, really unborn babies, right? Um, And and the parents of right. <laughs> so what I mean by that is parents of in unplanned pregnancies, I guess is what I would I work with a fair amount of them as well. And a lot of them are are really hurting and scared and yeah, so sorry. Okay. Yeah, I thought we. No, we don't have that one. Okay. Okay, I think that's um, enough for us to to go off of here. So as we look at those lists, these are people that not all of us come in contact with all of these people, right? And not all of us can can speak into all of these people's lives. But I think every one of us here could probably pick somebody, some human being on that list that you could, in your circle of influence, add some value to their life. Um, because I think so many times we think of justice as being that out there thing that um, doesn't really apply to my personal day-to-day -day life, and it absolutely can apply to your life. So, um, so now, the next thing that I want us to think about here is how can we bring back the value that God has given these groups of people? Think, I want us to just really, really sit in the the, the truth of the fact that every single one of these has a value that has been placed upon them by their creator that is equal to the value that has been placed on your life as well. And so without like putting aside our biases, our, our self-interests and our favoritisms, how can we now bring back a bit of that value to these people's lives. How might that look? Now, um, I do think there would be some value in 
and going into some small groups and and talking through people in this in this list and and talking about where where you intend to maybe reach out and make a difference. So um, I, I'm not going to micromanage this, but take six six or eight of you in the little groups and uh, and talk about talk about how you're going to. Um, bring bring value back into some of these <coughs> lives there. All right, can you do that? Are you awake enough? Let's see. I don't. We may have to shuffle around a little bit. Or I don't know. all going to be a group right here? <laughs> Robert, you can take the lead with this group if you don't mind.
All right, maybe about one minute and wrap to wrap it up. Yeah. All right, hopefully uh, that was meaningful discussions there. It sounded, I could hear just enough that made me want to hear more about it. Uh, I think what we'd like to do now is, is to, if one person from each of the groups could just give us a, a real little, uh, you know who you are in your group, uh, if you're the, the one that's going to give this uh, little update. So, so just share with the larger group here kind of a, a quick little summary of what you Maybe an interesting point that you gathered from that. Can we start with the back corner over there? You want to go ahead? Um, I can't read name tags yet. Go ahead. Yes, you. Oh, he's way in the some 
give you some idea of one thing that we'll, we talk about is like, it's not to just to say good work to someone like he, you, Valvo, you're a nice person, oh. but it's to do something, to work like he, if you see children that has no opportunity to go to school and you can change that possibility doing a program that will help okay. them to go to school, that is just. Okay. So you needed to do something for that. So it's not just saying be warmed and filled, uh, <laughs> but it's actually doing something about it. Okay. Very good. Very good. How about the over here? I guess there's different avenues. Um, in, I guess we came down to spending time, taking time, uh, not our time, but time for them. You kind of shared that when you shared out a little bit, getting to know them and building relationships. Of mm -hmm. course, God to open doors that we can't, and so that's part of it. And I think different passions were shared from um, just the, the elderly, uh, taking time to invest in them and help them find purpose. Oh, Sometimes okay, just right. knowing when they feel there's no purpose, how do you help them find purpose? And what does that look like? We talked about the unemployed as far as um, how you can connect and use resources to connect them to different resources and help them find their skill sets mm -hmm. that would allow them to contribute to what their skill set is. Right. So building connections. So just relationships, connections, and uh, time. Is that nice? That is a huge key, more than just handing out handouts, is, is bringing purpose back, because that adds value, right, exactly. Very good. How about the guys up front here? One of the, uh, one example of thing we talked about was uh, a couple of our churches doing a lot of work around the whole foster care, um, adoption, single parent. Uh, efforts mm -hmm. um, and supporting families who are, who are offering that or doing that, um, but then also some work in the community, kind of where the kids come from. And a couple of the others, I guess, talked about kids around them, uh, inner city, kids looking for influence, looking for, um, I don't know, what would you say, Jason? Uh, <laughs> looking for something, right? Uh huh. <clears throat> you know, trying to be open to what what would work, what, what would that look like to add value to their lives. Okay, good. Well, if you want some added inspiration, there's a movie in theaters right now, right? Um, Sound of Hope. Okay, that's about foster care and adoption, and uh, it'll be pretty inspiring, I guess. How about the back? Uh, a couple things would. The idea of supporting, Daryl mentioned, I think it's like through a pregnancy center, but support for the fathers. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a unique approach to that. There's, I think there's enough support for the mothers as well, but that, um, many even mentioned just walking with people when you know the need through it and helping them, not just telling them what to do, but mm -hmm. spending the time and the effort, whether it's driving them, <coughs> getting them hooked up. Um, the young man back here, just the idea of their there's quite a few ministries out there that are doing some of this, but joining them, supporting them. Yes, uh, right. Mentioned City Challenge and getting out there and doing it. And Gator Camp, they, their youth went there mm -hmm. and supporting those ministries. Um, and then the time, but then to hear it, just asking them to tell their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, even starting there, I think, is a big thing that adds value to people when they see you want to actually know what their story is and not skip the bias part and just let's see what they, who they really are. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. I wonderful good ideas. The the pregnancy center I is that's another one that I 100% agree with. Um, you can go out on the streets and hold up a sign of of body parts and all that, and you probably aren't going to really impact very many people's lives. But if you sit and listen to their stories, um, I I volunteer once a week at a pregnancy center and meet with the young men that come in with their girlfriends and. Just so 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 powerful to be able to just hear their stories and yep. Um, back group over here now. We talked about uh, breaking the cycle of biases that we have um, perhaps learned since our childhood and modeling for our children and our grandchildren. 
uh, by including them in different activities. They're vulnerable in need. We also talked about modeling um, compassion and not labeling somebody based on their behaviors or the outward signs that they're distributing mm -hmm. or uh, modeling, but seeing them um, through a lens of Christ. And, um, or perhaps we have two neighbors that um, are disliking each other, but finding commonalities with each neighbor and being that uh, mediator. Mm, okay, right. I really want to um, point out the first thing you said about breaking those biases that have been handed down to us a lot of times, actually. Uh, we bring um, messages from our parents and grandparents is that, that we maybe aren't even aware of. That uh, Pete Scazzaro often says, he says, Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa is in your bones. And uh, we bring, bring those biases with us, and now intentionally breaking them is possible, though. And so that's a good, good point. How about the front group here? We talked a lot about immigrants. Um, and I and ways to, like, uh, uh, helping them understand the language, the culture. Uh -huh. A lot of times they will do things that are okay in their culture, but they're offensive in our culture. Um, and so trying just to help to bridge the gap between the cultures. Right. And then also, Brother here made a comment, in, um, and you could probably say it better than I did, it's a child it's not it's not their fault as the way well, I can go ahead I, I I took the example of the uh, the statement how can we bring back the value God has given them sometimes can be misleading <laughs> take an orphan you don't want to change that God has a sign of value to the orphan and it's, an, it's a value which we need to understand from Scripture. He's now the father of the orphan. Yeah. The foster child may have an, a, a wrong idea of who, of who he is. So we need to restore the fact that there is nothing wrong with you being a foster child. Mm -hmm. Don't change. God has control of his job. And we don't want to place our control over that. <laughs> okay, yeah. We want to do, to facilitate what will get them to accept themselves first. In other words, reject the lies. Yeah, yeah. All that. All that stuff that you're being submitted to is really the product of lies. So, so you bring out a good point. This is actually kind of stated wrong. Th their value is still there. <laughs> <coughs> but um, we, uh, we can't. We're not really bringing it back because it's still there, is what you're saying. That. Recognize the value that is there. <laughs> We, we yeah. need to help them live the life that God intended for them to have. Right, good. Excellent. Well, all right, this, was, this, this last little portion was, was really, really uh, encouraging to me. And uh, my heart for each one of you would be that you would leave here with a kind of an intentionality in your heart to, to, to go out and, and do something different uh, based on maybe what you heard here. Um, a number of years ago, I was reading about uh, two terrible times in history, when America had slaves and when during the Holocaust. And I remember thinking, what would I have done if I had lived in one of those time periods? And immediately I felt God saying, it's easy to know what you would have done. What are you doing today about the slavery and the, and the Holocaust of your day? And so what are you doing today about those issues of your day? So that's what I'll leave you with. Um, thank you all for your um, engagement and interaction. Um, trust you'll have a good rest of the afternoon. That's all I have. Thank you. Yep.